ulcer or mesothelioma after using Johnson & Johnson talc products. Call our lawyers at 1-800-835-1207 now. Johnny Depp and Amber Heard met in 2009 while making a movie. They began a romantic relationship a couple of years later when they were promoting that movie together. They were living a life many dream of. Fame, money, and love. But inside this dream life was nightmarish behavior involving drinking, drugs, jealousy, and violence. He was mad at me for taking the job with James Franco. He hated James Franco and was already accusing me of kind of secretly having a thing with him in my past. If you have those memory, uh, 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 you know, d divots. I was upset. There was a lot going on, okay. and I was well, in, on an ambient. Okay. Like, why, well, like, why are you obsessing over the fact that I can't remember it the way you remembered it? I said I was sorry. Okay. I didn't deny I know it. That I'm not One of the physical altercations between the Hollywood couple happened on a staircase. In my head, instantly think of Kate Moss and the stairs, and I swung at him. And all of my relationship to date with Johnny, I hadn't landed a blow. And I, for the first time, hit him. This took place on the landing, trying to get to me, trying to hit me. And then Whitney, her sister, was there. When she was in between us, Amber snuck in the... She, Reached, got the roundhouse in. This hour, we return to that staircase to figure out why they were fighting and who was abusing who. Plus, we take a look at photos obtained exclusively by Court TV of that staircase and the aftermath of this confrontation as we continue our in depth coverage of Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. I'm Vinny Politan. Thanks so much for joining us tonight here in Closing Arguments. Big night, big show coming up. We've got, first of all, uh, a Court TV exclusive tonight. We've got some photographs. Um, not in evidence. Jury hasn't seen them. We're going to show them to you tonight. Some of the aftermath of, of one of these confrontations, one of these blow-ups between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. It was the one on the staircase. Speaking of The Staircase, um, it's the name of a brand new series. I don't know if you've seen it on HBO Max. Everyone's talking about it. It, it. It's a story not necessarily about defamation, but it's a story about murder. But it's a husband and it's a wife. Um, and it involves a, a man named Peterson who is accused of murdering his wife. Now, it's, it's not Scott Peterson who murdered his wife, Lacey, not Drew Peterson, who murdered his wife and has another wife missing out in Bolingbrook, Illinois. No, it was Michael Peterson, a novelist from uh, Durham, North Carolina. Now, this is a, a, a show, a scripted show. Colin Firth is playing Michael Peterson. But it was a real trial and a real case, and it was on court TV. A few moons ago, by the way, um, and it was something that I covered myself. It was what I call my, my Summer of Petersons because I was going from the East Coast to the West Coast, from Durham to Modesto, covering two cases involving a, a, a husband accused of murdering his wife, Durham with Michael Peterson, then out to Modesto for the preliminary hearing of Scott Peterson. Um, it was, it was a, a crazy year, but when I was in Durham, um, the case of Michael Peterson, the one that involves a brutal murder on a staircase or in a staircase. Well, guess what, folks? I was on that staircase. I was there. I, all right, the hair's a little darker, but I was on the staircase. Take a look. This is the staircase where Kathleen Peterson died that night. If you look at the bottom of the stairs, you can still see the blood stains. Now, the prosecution says these stains are evidence of murder, but the defense says these same stains are evidence of a tragic accident. That was me. That was me. All right, 
Let's, let's bring it back to, the, to Fairfax County, Virginia now. We're out of Durham, we're back to Fairfax, but we're talking about yet another staircase tonight. This is the uh, big blow up between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, one of several that we've heard about during the course of the trial. In case you don't recall the nature of this one, let's take a listen back to opening statements. But Amber finds uh, on a TV screen, uh, his monitor, she finds pictures of another woman, naked pictures of a woman, and text messages which show that he's clearly having an affair. She gets extremely mad. Amber can be jealous too. She can get angry. You know, she's half his age, and you know, she she's you know defiant. And we're not going to say she's perfect. She was mad as can be when she saw that, and she confronted him. The two of them were screaming at each other. Now her sister Whitney happened to be in the house. She was summoned. She literally was awakened to come and try to resolve this fight between the two of them. While she's there, Johnny starts hitting Amber, um, and it, Whitney ends up getting in between them. And Amber thinks that Johnny's going to throw her down, f push her down the stairs because he's in that position. So Amber actually gets up and punches Johnny in the face. She'll tell you that's the only time she has ever laid one on him, you know, in a, a, an aggressive manner. But it's after he's already been hitting her and it's in defense of her sister. And she'll admit she got him that time and she actually did have an impact on him. All right, so this is where she's conceding that she punched Johnny Depp. Amber Heard. Uh, but Johnny Depp says all the other stuff, that's not true. I was not hitting her. She hit me. Now, in court, witnesses have testified uh, that fight led to a physical altercation between Depp and Heard on a staircase. This is in um, their Los Angeles penthouse. Now, this hour, you'll hear testimony from Amber Heard, Johnny Depp, and Depp's bodyguard about what happened. And Court TV has exclusively obtained photos that appear to show the aftermath of that incident. This is March of 2015. Our source provided an alleged text exchange uh, containing the photos from uh, Amber Heard's sister Whitney and Johnny Depp's estate manager. Here's what that uh, text exchange says. Good, good morning, sir. So um, Johnny destroyed Amber's closet and there's some damage to PH5. You're the lucky person I should talk to about that, correct? I suppose so. I'm up. Insanity. Just blank insanity. And now, here are the exclusive photos of that damage. Let's take a look. Um, they show racks of Amber's clothes knocked over on the floor. Um, racks of shoes toppled over. Both Amber Heard and Johnny Depp's bodyguard testified that Depp caused this mess that you see in, in the photo. So that's conceded to a certain extent. You'll hear them tell the story in their own words uh, this hour. Now, Court TV, we've reached out to Johnny Depp's legal team. They've had no comment on these photos. Let's bring in tonight's guests. Joining us tonight in Austin, Texas, trial attorney Holly Davis, and in Los Angeles, California, forensic psychiatrist Dr. Praveen Kanban. Great to have you both here. Um, Holly, let me ask you, all right, we've got photographs. It's a mess. Um, it's conceded that Johnny Depp is the one who created this mess. What do these pictures tell us that the witnesses don't tell us? Anything? Yes, I think we can see two bad actors and two bad acts. We've got a person who... Wait, wait, when you say bad actor, do you mean like bad actor or someone <laughs> acting badly? Both. I, I, I feel like we've got two actors who are mutually abusing the other. We've got Johnny Depp who has conceded to damaging that staircase and to damaging those clothes, to causing that wreck, that scene. We have Amber Heard who admitted to punching Johnny Depp on the staircase. And so we've got, these pictures are actually fascinating, Vinny, because it shows the extent to which Johnny's reaction was. And Johnny denies hitting Amber in that moment, but he does admit causing this mess. And I think this mess is extensive. And think about it, look at those racks. You have to be creating a lot of force to turn them over. That clothing looks very heavy. So that is a really uh, physical mess that was created uh, and apparently conceded to by Johnny Depp. The uh, question still remains whether or not he committed physical violence on Amber Heard that night. And that's the ultimate question. Yeah, um, the other part of this is, this is an enormous closet. Can we just all admit this is an enormous 
closet. Huge. It's a lot of shoes. A lot, lot of shoes. shoes a lot of, a lot of purses. Okay. Uh, doc, Dr. Kambon, I want you to listen to Amber Heard here describing why there was a fight that night, why there was this, this argument, this confrontation, and then whatever else happened, depending upon who you're listening to. Uh, let's listen. Because we were kind of in the bedroom together the night of the 22nd, um, which is when he passed out how I found his iPad. I'm sorry, when you... Uh... I, I found his iPad open he was texting someone with it open he passed out and i saw what he was texting please tell the jury about that uh he was uh, he was texting this woman um that he had had a, a relationship with on and off um kind of at the beginning of our um relationship so i recognized the name but the date was right after the wedding I freaked out. I immediately, like, confronted him about it. I was, you know, I, I didn't care in that moment if he did kill me, which is likely in confronting him at that stage of our lives. I want to focus on three words that she said, uh, Dr. Kanban. I freaked out. When someone says that about their own behavior, what, what should we take away from that? Well, obviously, we don't have a term for that in psychiatry. So you really need to ask people what they mean. Uh, it could be that they had their emotions just take control over them and acted without really thinking that part of your brain took over versus the front part of your brain that kind of controls us. Uh, that's usually what people mean, but you really have to ask them because that can mean many, many, many different things. Uh, how about this, though? This is from a, a witness, Amber Heard, you know, who seems very much under control inside the courtroom, which is different than what we've heard on some of the recordings, uh, different than what we saw in her deposition. Um, I I'm wondering, like, if she's saying, I freaked out out it, it just seems to me that it's an acknowledgement that she lost some level of control control that we've seen in in, in the courtroom um her i mean she's been very stoic when listening to johnny depp um it's it's quite a contrast yes i mean i think here you've got legal strategy as well right so it depends on what her legal team has has decided is the best way to present here in court i know we talked about this on a previous episode but there's also the the nonverbal, the emotional kind of gut feeling that goes towards the jury and so if there is evidence that that's admitted to that there was some sort of altercation and there's a witness that saw her actually punching then the legal team has to come up with an explanation for that, for the jury to, to, to actually uh, believe and, and feel does not alienate them from her. And this could be that. Okay, Holly, I have something else for you to listen to and, and okay. take a look at. This is Johnny Depp testifying about his injury from this incident. Um, I believe that's, uh, well, it's, Definitely me. Um, uh, after uh, receiving a, kind of a a, 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 a roundhouse um, punch um, from Miss Hurd, I believe that this is uh, it's March. Uh, I believe that this is from what's been called the staircase incident. That's what we're calling it. Okay, Holly, which is more revealing to you now? We, we showed you the exclusive pictures that we've obtained of the aftermath. There's another picture of some aftermath, which is more revealing about what happened. The bruise on Johnny Depp's face, and here's why, Vinny. Obviously, the jury knew coming into it from the opening statements that Amber Heard was going to go on and on about all of the atrocities that occurred uh, on her at the hands of Johnny Depp. 
But the fact of the matter is, is that Amber Heard definitely punched Johnny Depp in the face. And so I believe this portion of her testimony was very rehearsed, very calculated, and strategically designed to explain to the court why in this case Amber Heard was the aggressor or the you know abuser in this instance. And to me, this, this moment is at the heart of the case for the jurors because they're asked to believe whether or not the statement in the op-ed was false about her being a victim of domestic violence. And landing a haymaker on Johnny Depp and admitting to that is sort of the opposite of being a victim of domestic violence. So she has to explain this to the jurors, why that's so discrepant from what she's claiming throughout the rest of the trial. Great analysis. That is, that is spot on analysis. Okay. Holly, Dr. Praveen Kanban staying with us. Holly Davis staying with us. When we come back, you're going to hear Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. They'll tell us the story of what happened on the staircase, and we'll have one more guest join us. Janine Driver will break down the body language next.
made like no other. He was about to push my sister down the stairs. She was attempting to break us up. I am protective over my baby sister. When he laid hands on her, I don't know what I did, but I know I jumped in between the actions that I saw could lead to a fatal injury to my sister. She was standing on the top of a flight of the stairs and she has never hurt anyone in her life and she does not deserve to be pushed down the flight of stairs. And it looked like she was about to be. And I would have done what anybody who has a child or a sister would have done. I acted defensively in her life. I saw her standing on top of a flight of his stairs and trying to interrupt a fight in between him and I. I don't know what part of my body I, I put in between me and him and, and her, but I would have done anything. I would have done anything to prevent her from being pushed down a flight of stairs. Amber Heard six years ago in a deposition describing the staircase incident. Well, now let's take a look at Johnny Depp and Amber Heard describing from their own perspectives what happened. Uh, Ms. Heard had her office at the top of the stairs. And so the, the stairs came down and then there was a, a landing and then another set of stairs went down the opposite direction. Uh, and. Uh, this took place on the landing um, where she was uh, coming out, you know, trying to, uh, well, trying to get to me, trying to hit me. But I was screaming at him because he threw this can at me and everything else that had happened. And when I did that, he bolted up the stairs. <laughs> and... You know, there's only, I mean, he, he was up he was up the first flight of stairs. Again, I'm on the mezzanine, which is in between two flights of stairs. Bolted up the steps. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I don't know how he managed to get his hands in my hair so fast that he had his um, hand on the back of my, my head, my hair and kind of was yanking me down and um, hit me in the face with this cast he had. And then Whitney, her sister, was there who, uh, who stepped in the way. And uh, interesting thing that was, was that inter what was interesting was that the, now is that Whitney stepped in front of Amber and was facing Amber to stop Amber. I just remember this, this brief struggle we had before kind of break away Whitney, my sister, um, all of a sudden put herself in between Johnny and I. Uh, she just threw herself like in the line of fire or whatever, she just all of a sudden, I was there and was trying to get Johnny to stop. And uh, when she was in between us, Amber snuck in the, she reached, got the roundhouse in and, and uh, just nailed me on the, on the cheekbone. I just, you can see my little sister with her back on, face, her back to the staircase and Johnny, swings at her and I don't even wait, don't even wait for any other, I don't hesitate, I don't wait, I just in my head instantly think of Kate Moss and the stairs and I swung at him. And all of my relationship to date with Johnny, I hadn't landed a blow. And I, for the first time, hit him, like, actually hit him square in the face wow still with us trial attorney holly davis forensic psychiatrist dr praveen kanban and joining us now in alexandria virginia new york times best-selling author of the book you can't lie to me retired atf investigator and world-renowned body language expert janine driver is back with us you can check her out on tiktok at body language institute okay janine driver 
What did you see? What did you notice in the way Johnny Depp and Amber Heard are describing the staircase incident? You just fed me a Thanksgiving meal. How am I gonna how am I gonna digest all of this at once, Betty? Oh my gosh, where to begin? If I if I were to pick the low-hanging fruit here, the obvious parts are when Johnny is telling the story, he's using what are called illustrators. If I were to tell you I'm climbing a ladder, I demonstrate climbing the ladder, tying shoelaces. We see that with Johnny, we're not seeing that with Amber. When people are telling the truth, they'll use the illustrators. He's telling us about the stairs and where they are at the landing and that how Whitney got behind them and, and she was over here. We're not seeing any of these hand gestures. It's incongruent. And there's a word that Amber's using here that's suspicious to me, which is kinda. You know, if I said to you, I kinda jumped in the pool or I'm, I'm kinda married or I kinda have an open marriage. Do I have an open marriage or do I not? If you're on Bumble and a guy says he's kinda married, you should be concerned. <laughs> All right. Dr. Pra Praveen Kanban, here's a question I have for you because I have never been in an altercation like that. The closest is on the soccer field or on the basketball court, and it's very quick. But even right now, thinking back to those instances, it was many moons ago, I, I can't remember specifics. Like, how much should we trust the memories of people who are in a very volatile, emotional, physical altercation? Yeah, great question. So... As we were talking about earlier, let's say that reflex emotional part of your brain just takes over and the thinking and the what we call the executive part of your brain is sort of shut off and lets you do whatever type of actions. You may actually somewhat not remember all of the factors um, or you may have some distortion of it and just remember the emotions. You know, Remember there's different types of memory that gets encoded. So that can certainly happen with folks. Uh, and you, you hear about that in fights, you hear about that in really emotional type of reactions. There's some court cases where people have even said that I was temporarily insane because I was overcome by various things. I know there's allegations of, of substance use uh, that occurs sometimes that can alter and shut off that part of your brain. Think about the, the drunk hooligans getting in fights and not quite remembering things. So yeah, that, that can definitely happen in those types of situations. Janine Driver, I want to ask you about an, another statement that was made by Amber Heard, where she said that was the that was the first time I landed a blow. I don't. It struck me a little yeah. like it was the first time you you connected, like you missed the first. Yeah, 10 like that times? was the first what time. That, what that, does that mean? Like that's the first. That's the first time she was proud of the one that she landed. You know, yeah. when when Johnny was talking, by the way, Vinny, when Johnny was talking about uh, you know Amber's sister getting involved, he goes, the weird part is, and his eyebrows go up in an eyebrow flash, and surprise is the quickest of all emotions. If if someone throws a surprise party for you and you you come in, and you're like. Oh, for more than a second, someone told you there was going to be a surprise party. So Johnny goes from this surprise, eyebrows up and curved, to happiness. He laughs. It's that awkward laugh, and that's indicative of, of telling the truth. You know, going back to kind of really quick, Johnny said kind of just before when you were introducing us here, he said she kind of gave a roundhouse punch. My motto is when you hear a kind of, there's more to find a. You're going to hear with Travis McGiven, if you're going to play a clip from him, he's going to say a kind of as well when talking about the emotions. So when I say action versus emotion, if someone's using a kind of with the action, there's more to the story. Demonstrate. You kind of made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. How did you make it? Tell me step by step how you made it. I kind of was angry. He kind of looked embarrassed like I did. Emotions are complicated. So a kind of belongs there with emotions. So again, when you hear a kind of, there's more to find a. Holly, who, who are you hearing as the initiator, the aggressor? The, 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 like if you're trying to figure out, oh, okay, we're looking at this situation, one person is, is more wrong than the other. Who would it be? I'm so glad we have the body language expert on the show tonight, Vinny, because I am looking at the body language. Who in the deposition was so angry she bared her teeth at the person asking the question Amber heard? And that was six years ago. She leaned over. She bared her teeth. She was angry and mad as hell. And and when do we see Johnny Depp, uh, you know, talking to the court? It's slow. It's lilting. It's you know, very, very soft spoken. And whether or not that's coached, whether or not that's legal strategy, I don't think Amber Heard can help herself. She couldn't help herself under oath in the depot. She can't even help herself on the stand. She bears her teeth. 
She is so angry. She's seething, in my opinion. And I don't have any background in body language like our other expert here tonight. But I do have some common sense. And as a juror, I am noticing that Amber Heard looks scary to me. And she hasn't been crossed yet. She has not no. been crossed yet. Okay. She, uh, listen, she looks scary, not scared. And that's right. the big difference. Correct. And it is that Correct. anger. It's anger. It's actually scorn. It's a combination of anger and disgust, which is yeah. scorn. That's not fear. Guests are staying with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about the third party witnesses who were there during this staircase incident. That is next. that point 
out of the corner of my eye, I saw a, a fist and an arm come across my right shoulder. And uh, I heard and saw a closed fist um, contact Mr. Depp in the left side of his face. And whose fist was that? That was Miss Hurd's fist, Amber Hurd's fist. Johnny Depp's bodyguard testifying in the case, describing what he saw. And, and what he saw was Amber Heard, as she said, punch Johnny Depp. Now, he also testified about um, some of what happened inside that penthouse apartment where Amber Heard had a closet full of clothes. Take a listen. Mr. Depp um, went upstairs and rearranged her closet for her, um, threw down probably every rack of clothing and shoes, um, threw one, at least one down the stairs. Um, yeah, he, he, he was upset. And Core TV has exclusively obtained photos of what we believe is this alleged rearrangement of Amber Heard's closet. Let's take a look. We begin with the staircase. Let's, here we go. Now we can see it. So there's the staircase. You see the rack down at the bottom of that staircase. Couple things I want to point out here. Number one, the description, you know, the clothes tossed all the way down. Um, number two, the, the staircase. Oh, it's gone, but how steep the staircase is. Up next, We've got uh, inside, oh, there we go. There's the staircase again. So you can see how steep the staircase is. And, and remember what Amber Heard is alleging, that you get thrown down that staircase, it could be a fatal situation. Now let's go to the closet. Um, you'll see all the racks are tossed down. Uh, you also notice how big the closet is, by the way. I think this penthouse is basically where she kept clothes and, and purses and shoes. Let's take a look at uh, more of the damage. Another rack that has been uh, pushed over. Um, as the bodyguard described rearrange, I think he was trying to be a little bit cute with that, but it's not rearrangement. This is, this is destruction. This is um, knocking stuff around. Let's take a look at the next photo. Uh, again, another rack. And he did say it was almost all the racks. And I think we have one final picture. Uh, there's one more from inside the closet. And then there's a picture where you can see the kitchen from the uh, penthouse apartment as well. And this was one, this was PH5, Penthouse 5. Let's bring back in our guests, Holly Davis, Dr. Praveen Kanban, and Janine Driver with us. Uh, uh, Janine, how about uh, the bodyguard's description? What did you notice about what he said and, and any significance there? I bet you're picking up on it already, Vinny, because he used this gesture, this illustrator. He said it came over his right shoulder, and we see him turn the body as if he was there. He also is going up. His name is Travis McGiven, and he's he's visualizing. So when he talks about Amber, Amber punching Johnny, and, and, and then he talks about the closet, we're getting the same behavior from him, both stories. He's very visual. He's picturing in his mind's eye both scenarios. He doesn't deviate. It's not like we see one version of Travis and another version when he talks about the clothes. It makes me feel like this is a truthful statement that he's sharing with us. Um, you know, when, when I think about um, this part of, of what happened, right? There, there's Johnny Depp's version, I didn't do anything, I got hit. The bodyguard saying he got hit. Well, there is someone else there, which is uh, Amber's sister, Whitney, has not testified yet, should be crucial. Here's Johnny Depp talking about Whitney. Great. I mean, fantastic. She was, I called her sis. Have you ever done any drugs with uh, Whitney? Yes. How often would you do that? With Whitney. Yes, with Whitney. Maybe two, two times, three times, maybe twice, three times. All right, Janine Driver, anything there we should we should notice? Uh, Johnny's, I mean, well, he's, he's fascinating just to watch him speak. Um, every every little movement. 
Well, here's the deal in this statement. So, of course, we see him looking and thinking about it. I will tell you, law enforcement, we know from looking at deceptive and truthful statements, most people will lie and say three. I came in three minutes late. I only did this three times unless we're talking about drugs and alcohol. And when we talk about drugs and alcohol, you're pulled over by the police. Did, did you drink tonight? I only had a couple. So we hear him say two or three. These are the liars numbers when it comes to drugs and alcohol. So that's a hot spot for me here. I wouldn't be surprised if it was more than two or three. All right. Holly Davis, how important will Whitney's testimony be? It is Amber's sister, but seemed like she was close to Johnny at, at, at some point. Yes, I think she'll be important, but remember her bias. She's a sister. She's related to Amber. I'm very curious as a juror, which way were you facing? Was Johnny correct that Whitney was facing Amber in order to stop Amber, who admits to hitting Johnny Depp, or was she facing away? Uh, and that would help us understand a little bit more about it. But again, so important but biased. Uh, Dr. Praveen uh, Kamban, the allegation by Amber Heard is that Johnny Depp is going after Whitney. Uh, he's swinging at Whitney. Um, explain to us in, in a moment of anger and fury and there's a third person involved, does that, does that have a ring of truth to you that in, in whatever's happening, someone who has nothing to do with this, this, this angst between husband and wife uh, could be the target of one of the people? Well, I mean, I think here there's some of the facts th that we need to know and that we'll probably hear a little bit more about with further testimony. Was it back facing, facing the other way or not? But separate of this case, just in general, I mean, think about, as I said, you're, you're losing control, right? And you're kind of getting back to your animal part of your brain acting. Well, have you ever tried to get in the middle of two dogs fighting? You know, they can attack and, and just, you could be the side effect basically of the thing. I'm not saying people are dogs, but you know, when you're getting into that level of emotionality and loss of control, you sure, you can lash out at whatever is around you, whatever is trying to stop you. And if all these other factors uh, that we talked about earlier are involved, like substance, that can cloud your judgment. So I, I don't think that that's uh, outside of the realm of possibilities. All right. Um, Holly Davis, Janine Driver, thank you both so much. Uh, we will see you again really soon. Don't forget the cross-examination. Janine, make sure you're watching Monday. Okay. I'm going to be in the courtroom Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, in the courtroom, and I'm going to weigh in on the jury. I'll be having my notebook in front of me. What do I think the jury thinks of the cross-examination? All right, so if you're in the courtroom, that means you're on the show. Thank you, Janine. We'll see you again. Mm -hmm. Holly, great to see you as well. Uh, doctor, I need you to hang out for just a minute because there are a whole bunch of fans who have been showing up at the courthouse. We're going to show you a little bit about them, and I want the doctor to take us into the mind of the Johnny Depp fanatic.
umgc.edu. What a scene down in Fairfax County, Virginia. It's not the Beatles, it's Johnny Depp. All right, folks, um, it has been part of the story uh, of, of what's happening at the courthouse is the huge number of Johnny Depp fanatics. Chanley Painter takes a closer look tonight. I definitely support Johnny, 110%. There's not a doubt in my mind. Dedicated Johnny Depp fans camp outside the Fairfax, Virginia courthouse in the late night hours of Tuesday, May 3rd. They're hoping for a wristband that will get them into the courtroom to see the stars in person. It's the day after Johnny Depp's team rested its case as the plaintiff in the high stakes defamation trial against his ex-wife Amber Heard. At approximately 9.45 p.m., the first two in line are Yvonne and her best friend, Debbie, Johnny Depp super fans. They're bundled up for a long night of waiting. She's my cohort in crime. So we go to all the concerts, we go to the premieres, premieres, any events, anything with Johnny. And we've been here for two weeks, for the first two weeks of the trial, just for Johnny. I'm from L.A., Debbie I'm is from Houston. Houston, and we've been fans forever. I've been his biggest fan for 36 years. At 10 p.m., one fan is seen walking their dog to pass the time. At 10.30 p.m., the wind picks up at the courthouse, but that doesn't stop these two fans who drove in from Virginia. There's our other regulars right there. Just got here. At 11 p.m., two men arrive unloading sleeping gear from their car. They are ready for the camping hours ahead. It's early. We can't just watch this on TV. It's not the same experience. At 11.30 p.m., a woman from South Carolina arrives with a sleeping bag, pillow, and blanket. Just before midnight at 11.45 p.m., the rain moves in and more fans come pouring in. Uh, what time do we come? 12.50. 12.50. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> the rain didn't stop you. No. Oh, no. It did not stop you. No. <laughs> After a few hours pass, more fans settle in. At 2.30 a.m. the next day, the line has extended as far back as the front entrance of the courthouse. Some of them started showing up around 11, a few, 12, and then yeah, one. I know, but I, Keep uh, I lost track after they got out of my range. At 3 a.m., the rain continues to steadily come down. New arrivals show up one by one and sometimes in groups, all for a chance at getting one of the coveted wristbands. I've never seen it this time this far back. Have you? No. At 5.30 a.m., over 90 people are in line. The early campers began cleaning up, taking their sleeping gear, chairs, and food back to their cars. A number of them even change out their clothes in their cars. At 6.45 a.m., as the sun is beginning to rise, more energy fills the area as people now stand up in line and prepare for deputies to arrive. At 7 a.m., Fairfax County Sheriff's deputies set up a table to distribute the 100 wristbands reserved for the courtroom where Depp and Hearn are squaring off. Johnny Depp superfans Yvonne and Debbie are the first up. What does she write on there? Just the number one. How about number, number one? one? At 7.45 a.m., the last of the 100 wristbands are given away for seats in the courtroom. All passes for quarter of five days have been given out this time. We're now giving out the Another 50 wristbands will let people into an overflow courtroom where people watch the trial on monitors. This is my first time trying to get in. Oh, wow. So, I didn't know if I was way too late or not. Nearly two hours later, with 100 fans packed in the courthouse, a black SUV pulls into a closely guarded parking lot. It's now 9.30 a.m. And Johnny Depp has arrived for another day in court. And
And the amazing thing is, I was there the first week, and there was no line. You just got in. You had to get the wristband, but you still, you got in. Yeah, I mean, you have to go overnight. Just show up. All right, let me bring back in Dr. Praveen uh, Kanban. Uh, uh, doctor, explain to us the, the, the fandom, the fanaticism of folks um, who would spend all night, all night in the rain to get a wristband to be in that courtroom. Well, remember, you just said it. The word fan originally may have come from the shortening of fanatic. So you see people camping out, doing all kinds of things for sports teams, concerts, your favorite band, outside of Comic-Con, what have you. So this is a high-profile trial in the public light. It's almost like a sports team. It's this year's Super Bowl of the high-profile lawsuits. And on top of that, this has become a social media phenomenon and it's um, had a lot of dramatic moments, which makes it great for TV. So I think that all those things uh, feed into why people are following this. And a lot of times fans will identify with uh, a side of an issue, a character, or even a social cause. And there can be elements uh, such as cognitive dissonance. Say there are super fans of you know, Mr. Depp for years and years, and then he's accused of something and it doesn't fit their their images in their heads. There's sort of a disconnect and dissonance. And so they have to kind of explain that emotionally in their head, and that can kind of fuel, fuel this identification with the side or the cause. Um, I know that some fans have said that they're there to offer support for, for Mr. Depp, and you know, maybe that happens outside, uh, but there could be practical uh, effects of support if you actually get in the courtroom. Now think about the jury, uh, if they're around fans that maybe laugh at some of the testimony that, that Mr. Depp makes or otherwise, there's, remember, emotions and reactions can be contagious, and the jury is not going to be immune to that. Think about when you're around other people laughing, you kind of look to them, and then you laugh as well. It's almost like a social cue on how to interpret the data that's coming in. Home court advantage, potentially. How about this? What impact do you think all this is having on Johnny Depp? Well, I can't get into his mind without actually interviewing him, talking to him. But uh, I think the thing to remember here is there's two trials. There's the actual defamation trial, and then there's the court of the public opinion. And it's a very interesting case where this may involve allegations about somebody's ability to work based on their uh, popularity, maybe that they were canceled because of certain things. And so you got to win the court of public opinion. And even if you lose the defamation trial, maybe you'll be able to still work. So I think there's kind of two, two trials that uh, um, need to be won here for Mr. Depp's side. Yeah, it, it is quite a scene. It, it's taken a while for it to sort of take off and snowball, but uh, you could see, you saw the long line of people who did not get it, and those are people who were there for hours. Uh, it's 100 wristbands and then 50 for the overflow, and that is it. And it's going to get even more intense this week coming up. Uh, Dr. Praveen Kamban, great to have you on tonight. Thanks so much for your time and your insight. We'll see you again soon. All right, folks, when we come back, um, we're going to bring in our legal think tank, go through some of the evidence, take a look at the tale of the tapes, the audio, and the video, including the full extended version of the Mega Pint video. Don't go anywhere.
Fairfax County, Virginia, Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. Both parties to this dueling defamation trial have taken the stand to tell their stories of violence and abuse. Amber, please describe for the jury what this portrays. Um, that's my face after this incident. And what is what's portrayed on your lip? Um, well, he busted my lip when he punched me. And I said, "What do you what do you want to do? Hit me again? Would you like to hit me again?" And I said, "Go ahead, hit me." Bam. And then I just said, "Did that? Is that what you wanted? Would you like another?" Two totally different takes on what was happening in the relationship, both claiming to be victims of domestic violence. Tonight, the tale of the tapes as we take a look at the video evidence. That's crazy. Oh, you're crazy. Are you crazy? Have you drunk this whole thing this morning? Oh, you got this. You got this going. I just started it. Oh, really? Yes. And the audio recordings. I'm sorry that I didn't uh, uh, hit you across the face in a proper slap, but I was hitting you. It was not punching you. Babe, you're not punched. And we look at photos obtained exclusively by Court TV of the aftermath of the confrontation on the staircase inside of their Los Angeles penthouse. What do these photos reveal? On the docket tonight in Fremont County, Idaho, the doomsday couple case, Chad and Lori Daybell accused of murdering her children and burying them in his backyard. Tonight, the latest on the upcoming trials. Already scheduled for a trial to start on January 9th. The courts made some previous rulings that apply to this case and were set in that case as well, indicating that these cases would be tried in a joint trial. Plus, Amber Heard getting ready for crucial cross-examination next week here on Court TV. So tonight's 13th juror question, what one question would you ask Amber Heard? Buckle your seatbelts. This hour of closing arguments starts right now. I'm Betty Politan. Great to have you with us tonight here on Closing Arguments. The countdown continues next week. I, I can't explain how huge next week is in this case. The cross-examination of Amber Heard. I mean, it, it's her credibility on the line. How is that going to go? You're going to have to watch to figure it out. And, of course, we'll break it down here each and every night. Uh, the biggest moments, what it means, the body language, etc. In the meantime... Um, Let's talk about the staircase incident and the aftermath of it because we've got some exclusive photos tonight I want to show you. Uh, but I have to set the scene first. So there was this blow up on the staircase in one of the penthouses that Johnny Depp owns. I want you to listen to uh, Johnny Depp's bodyguard describe some of the damage that was done there, some of the physical damage involving the closet. <laughs> Mr. Depp um, went upstairs and rearranged her closet for her. Um, threw down probably every rack of clothing and shoes. Um, threw one, at least one, down the stairs. Um, yeah, he 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 was upset. Now, uh, Johnny's bodyguard is not the only witness to testify about the penthouse fight that led to a physical altercation between Johnny and Amber on a staircase in his Los Angeles penthouse. Court TV now has exclusively obtained photos that appear to show the aftermath of that incident. This incident took place, you got to go back, March of 2015. Our source provided an alleged text exchange containing these photos between Amber Heard's sister, Whitney, and Johnny's estate manager. Let me read part of that text exchange because I can't say all the words out loud, folks. Good morning, sir. So um, Johnny destroyed Amber's closet and there's some damage to PH5. You're the lucky person I should talk to about that, correct? 
I suppose so. I'm up. Insanity, just beep. Insanity. And now, folks, let's take a look at those exclusive photos of the damage, okay? Take a look. This is the actual staircase, right? The staircase in question. That's where the fight was. You see the racks are knocked down in this huge closet. See all the shoes and the shirts and the racks. Some more of the damage. Um, knocked on the ground. I mean, this is it's a, it's a mess. It's a mess. Somebody went nuts inside. A lot of clothes in the closet, but they're all on the ground. All the racks have, well, almost all the racks have been turned over. You saw the one rack at the bottom of the stairs. Um, absolute mess. And there is the kitchen as well. Appears to be some mess there. But this, to me, this is the key picture. Because at the bottom of the staircase, remember, this picture was taken, it seems, from the perspective of where that fight was on the landing. Okay? Now, let's bring in our guests, our think tank tonight. Joining us in the Bronx, New York, criminal defense attorney Renee Hill. In Houston, Texas, criminal defense attorney Carmen Rowe. And in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney, law professor at Emory University, and Georgia Innocence Project board member Molly Palmer. Welcome to you all. Um, okay? Honest answer, who's jealous of the of the closet that Amber had? <laughs> Anyone? I guess. That, yeah, that's, yeah, that's some closet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what here's my question, and, and I'll throw it to everyone here. Does does do these pictures support the theory or the or the allegation that Johnny is violent, he hit Amber and then he destroyed everything? Or does it support that Johnny was angry after getting hit and took revenge out on Amber's clothes and her closet instead of Amber herself? Renee. I think it's the latter. He has already indicated that he's assaulted, uh, what was it, the cabinets in the kitchen. And, you know, the pictures that we just looked at of, of the room, the closet rather, uh, is indicative of him being angry after something happening between the two of them. And yes, the room was rearranged, as the bodyguard said, in a fashion that someone would have been very angry. Carmen, you agree? I saw you shaking your head. I'm a body I language agree. expert now. I know, I agree, but you know, I think it's one of those things where she said she finally connected a blow. I mean, he got sucker punched. That's what most people would understand that to mean. And I think he was angry. And so I think this is indicative of his anger at being punched by Amber and taking his frustration, excuse me, out on the clothes rather than taking it out on her, which I think is consistent with his narrative. Okay. All right. Molly, I have a video I need you to watch. This is the extended version. I got you the long version of the so-called <laughs> mega pint video. You're going to see and hear Johnny Depp in this video. The question coming out on the other end will be, we've seen these photos of what Johnny has admittedly done. Watch what he does in this video. And is it consistent? And what you put the two together, what does it tell us? Something happened to you this morning? I don't think so. Um, no, that's the thing. You want to see crazy? I'll give you. That's crazy. Oh, you're crazy. Are you crazy? 
you're crazy. Have you drunk this whole thing this morning? Oh, you got this going. You got this going? Oh, really? Yes. Really? Okay, Molly, the pictures, the video, put it together. What does it tell us? Well, I think we, when we put it together, we also have to consider everything we've seen during the weeks of the trial. And honestly, I see Amber manipulating him. She's trying to get all involved, setting up her camera, asking what he's doing. He's trying to avoid her, not answer her questions. Then he gets frustrated when he realizes she's filming him. But I think it goes you know, consistent along, you know, what, what uh, my colleagues have said tonight with what he's already explained that yes, he did destroy the room, he destroyed the closet, he slammed the cabinet doors, but he's really trying to put some distance between himself and Amber and she's being provocative. And you hear him reference that something happened to him. And she says, I said, I was sorry. So I think in the context of the trial, neither these images nor that video is as damaging as maybe they would have thought to have been before we saw Johnny on the stand. Okay, I've got another video to show you, Renee. This is Johnny Depp in the elevator. Now, this is uh, May 21st. May 21st, significant date. This was the incident that, that led to several days later, Amber Heard going to get that protective order, okay? She says she was hit in the, in the face with a cell phone. After that argument, whatever happened, depending upon who you're listening to, this is Johnny Depp in the elevator afterwards. Let's take a look. Can we just, yeah, we'll just come in and just check? We just need to make sure everybody in here is okay and that nobody. Apparently, I have a call twice. Yeah. I don't know if she called twice or, or whoever called, but we just got another notification. So. We just need to come in and make sure that everybody's okay. Yeah, okay. They're all good. Nobody else is in here. No. Okay. Here's the elevator. That was the police body cam. Here's the elevator. Here's Johnny Depp. Uh, we see the door open. Wait for it. And a member of his team enters. There's Johnny with the hat on. Taking the jacket off. Mm -hmm. Moving around seems a little agitated. What are you What are you reading out of this, Renee? What are you seeing? Oh yeah, I mean he's definitely agitated. Obviously, something has just occurred, and and he's he's upset. You, he's pacing back and forth. We definitely see that. But outside of that, it, this is not indicative of anything in terms of showing that he has assaulted her. In any way, this is just showing that you know he's upset, he's agitated, and he's leaving the location again, distancing himself from her. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. Let, let's go back, if we can go back to the LAPD body cam, because there are two sets of officers that respond. The first don't have body cams, but then the second officers who respond, because I think there are two separate calls, um, neither of which were, were from Amber Heard. But let's take a look at the LAPD with the second response to the penthouse after this alleged assault by Johnny Depp. Can we just, yeah, we'll just come in and just check? We just need to make sure everybody in here is okay and that nobody. Apparently, I have a call twice. Oh, did? Yeah. I don't know if she called twice or, or whoever called, but we just got another notification. So. We just need to come in and make sure that everybody's okay. Yeah, okay. They're all good. Nobody yeah. else is in here? No. Oh, okay. the, the other officers came by and checked the apartment and the other apartment as well. Yeah, okay. It must have been like a double call. Oh, okay. Who's Amber? You? Okay. Johnny is definitely not here. He's not here? Okay. Okay, uh, Carmen, so... Again, we have to go back to how significant 
this um, alleged incident was. This was the one. All the abuse that Amber Heard has described in her testimony, only once did she go to seek a protective order. It was a few days after this one. This is the response that night. And the video um, seems very much ado about nothing. Must have been a mistake, Vinny. That's what she said. The second call's a mistake. She seems fine. She says everything's good. Thanks for coming. Goodbye. I don't need services. I don't need any assistance. I'm not willing to even talk with you. I mean, she didn't even get off the couch to talk with officers about anything. Like this is this is much to do about nothing. That's what she says at the scene. I mean, I just think it's it's another one of her exaggerations that she takes this scene, which she probably didn't think about the fact that it was being recorded, and then goes later and says, hey, this, this was a, a violent attack. Yeah, you know, Molly, I, I'm a former prosecutor. You know that, right? I remind you every week. I do. So oh, yes, yes. If this case came across my <laughs> desk, right, if this was the case, you know, this, this mm -hmm. assault, and Amber Heard's the mm -hmm. victim, and I've got this body cam, and I've got the, the testimony, the statements of the officers who responded the first time, there's no way that I would even bring the case, let, let alone get a conviction, because as a prosecutor, you're only supposed to bring a case that you believe you can prove beyond any and all reasonable doubt. If you're not doing that, then you're violating your ethical oath. Um, that's problematic here. Yeah, Vinny, I mean, that's a tremendous statement by you. I would have a feeling that maybe you would bring a lot of cases that other prosecutors wouldn't, but you're right. That it, you know, the standard for even charging somebody is so much lower than it is for a conviction, and we don't even have that here. And I think the other thing, when we look at this footage, I mean, these images, we have to remember that the op-ed, the defamation charge, stems from her saying she's a victim of sexual violence. And I think a lot hinges on that. Whatever she's alleging happened in Australia with the bottle, and a lot of this is just surrounding noise. And like we've we've already referred to her, her tendency to exist exaggerate her tendency to manipulate and I think to lie and that's what's a huge problem for her in this case mm -hmm. when we come back we've taken a look at some of the video our tale of the tapes continues as we listen to some of those audio recordings don't go anywhere
at nix.com. That's a recording of uh, Johnny Depp on that flight from Boston out to L.A. Uh, howling. Uh, why he was howling, the circumstances surrounded, it, obviously disputed. Uh, Amber Heard saying because he was drunk. He reeked of alcohol and marijuana. Johnny said he just had some uh, Roxy's and went to sleep, passed out in the bathroom. Um, there's some more audio. I want to play it for you because this is significant stuff. And, and these recordings, obviously, the person that's recording it knows the recording is going on, but does everyone else know that they're being recorded? Here's one where Amber Heard and Johnny Depp are speaking, and I want you to listen closely. Is, is, is there some level of a admission here by Amber Heard that she is the aggressor and that Johnny is a victim of domestic abuse? between us, I really did think I was going to lose my life, and I thought you would do it on accident. And I told you that. I said, oh my God, I thought the first time. Amber, I, I lost a finger, man, come on. I had a, I had a, a mineral can, a jar, a can of mineral spirits thrown in my nose. I, I, you can please tell people that it was a fair fight, and see what the, see what the jury and judge thinks. Tell the world, Johnny. Tell them, Johnny Depp, I, Johnny Depp, man, I, I'm a victim too of domestic violence. And yes. I, you know, it's a fair fight. And see how many people believe or side with you. Let's bring back in our think tank. I think that's an important piece of audio in all this. Uh, Carmen, um, what do we take away from that piece of audio? Is that an admission? by Amber Heard that she's committing domestic violence and that Johnny Depp is a victim. Vinny, I think there's no question. I mean, it's one of many statements that if you're listening closely and with a critical mind towards what you're hearing and who's saying it and under what circumstances, I mean, it's like even when you watch her in the course of that testimony or that audio, she starts to initially make a sad face. And then when she realizes what comes next, it's like, oh, right. <laughs> That's what I said. I mean, even just looking at her face, you see what what everyone else sees, which is her making these statements that he can't be a victim, that it's okay to hit him because she's a woman and he's a man. And somehow, as long as she doesn't hit him hard enough, like the sucker punch we talked about previously, then it's okay and he should just take it. Uh, uh, Molly? What, what did you hear there? Because this is, and, and you know, the, they know they're being, or I think she knows she's being recorded. He knows he's being recorded. I don't know. This is a conversation. They wanted, wanted to memorialize this conversation. Yeah, I mean, we do have a really interesting admission from Johnny saying, yes, I am a victim of domestic abuse. And I think there are two schools of thought on like who is a victim in a domestic abuse situation. Some people think you can have mutual abuse, you can be a victim and a perpetrator at the same time. But there's this other school of thought that basically says abuse is about manipulation and control. So even if you have mutual combat, it's the person who is manipulating and who is controlling, who is actually the abuser, even if they also end end up being abused themselves. And I think when we hear this, she again sounds like the manipulator and the controller. And that might be compelling enough for the jury to find for Johnny. Okay, let's listen to another one here. Uh, this, another situation where, where Johnny is threatening to cut his finger and you hear this moment that we're, you know, we're probably not supposed to hear, right? That's what this whole trial is. But listen closely, uh, Renee, let me know what you think about this situation, because this one I'm a little more confused about what to take away from it. And please do not cut your skin. Please don't. Okay. Why do would I do that? It's easy. 
Don't, please do not do that. Please do not do that. Don't, please don't. Please don't cut yourself. You don't need to cut yourself. I need to do what I want. I know. I know it hurts. I feel the same. Come here. I want your mark. Yeah. No, you don't. Yeah. They're gone. No, thank you. No, thank you. The sperm on the pillows. All right, what are we taking away from this? Um, he's <laughs> seemingly directing her to cut him. She's saying, I would never cut you. We know there's this whole thing about the severed finger. What, what, what are we taking away from this? Yeah, this is a little bizarre. And even when you watch him as the audio was being played in court, he's even chuckling at the end. And, and that's a little strange. Um, it, it's not... This particular recording, I think, is um, a little hurtful for Johnny's case in, in a sense of, like you just mentioned, you know, there's the whole severed finger thing, and it's her position that he did that to himself. And he's saying, of course, no, that she threw the bottle at him, and that's how it occurred. So here you have him asking her or saying, you know, cut me, cut me, or I'm going to cut myself. It's very hard to hear uh, at certain points as well. It's, it's, it's very low, they're very soft-spoken, you know, and it could have been almost in a joking fashion, And it, but it's hard to tell that because it is such a low voice in that particular recording. All right. Now, Amber Heard here talking about did she hit Johnny or did she punch Johnny? I don't know what the difference is, but let's listen. I said to Travis, I said, no, I said to you, hey, okay. tell Travis right. what just happened. You oh, you told me to do it. You yeah. told me to. You said, go do that. I said, no, tell, tell him what just happened. And I lied. And that you punched me in You're the thing. And you, you figured it out. And you said, no, you didn't. What the are you talking about? And I, I watched you, you lie. And then I, I didn't I punch you, by the way. You, I'm sorry that I didn't uh, uh, no, hit you across the face in a proper slap, but I was hitting you. It was not punching you. Babe, you're not punched. Don't tell me what it feels like to be punched. You, you know, even a lot of fights have been around a long time. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, we I, have a close You face. didn't get punched. You got hit. I'm sorry I hit you like this, but I did not punch you. I did not deck you. I hitting you. I don't know what the motion of my actual hand was, but you're fine. I did not hurt you. I did not punch you. I was hitting you. How are you talking? How? What am I supposed to do? Do this? I, I'm not sitting here about it, am I? You are. Oh, That's the difference between me and you. You're a baby. Because you start... You are such a baby! Grow the up, you Johnny! you physical fights? I did start a physical fight. Yeah, you did, so I had because to... There. Yes, you did. So you did the right thing, the big thing. The, you know what? You're admirable. This is, uh, is fascinating. Um, and it goes back to what Molly was saying about um, can you be a victim if, you know, this is part of the dynamic of what's happening in this relationship? Carmen, I, I, at a minimum, Carmen, this... If you're claiming to be a domestic violence survivor, this is not classic domestic violence survivor, uh, what we're hearing. It, to me, it's, it's, being, it's painting a picture of her of being disingenuous in trying to assume that role and then capitalize on it to get some, to get some press for your new movie. Um, Vinny, I, th I think that's exactly what it is. But in all seriousness, I think there's this cultural disconnect that people believe that men cannot be victims 
of, of a woman's physical abuse. And I really think that this, this audio is one of the most important that if I was a juror, I would really cling to because it suggests in that moment that not only does she think it's okay to hit him, as long as she doesn't punch him, it's acceptable. And that if he finds it to be something he doesn't want to accept, she's gonna call him a baby, which is to demasculate him or emasculate him in a way that makes him shameful of the fact that he could be a victim and that he should not be physically abused, whether it's hitting or punching. And it's one of these things where I think it's important to shine a light on that. But I think this audio says a lot about what she believes is acceptable physical abuse of another person, particularly a man who should be able to take it. And if he can't, then he's a baby. Yeah, this, this jury has a tough job in this case. They really, really do. And as we remind everyone, they're young, five young guys in their 20s. And um, I, I don't know how they're gonna make heads and tails of this, but they're going to, that's what juries do. All right, we know that this couple has their issues, but thank goodness, um, well, someone may have been hurt, but no one was killed. When we come back, we're going to talk about another couple. You talk about messed up relationships and everything else. The doomsday couple, Lori and Chad Daybell. Her children, dead, buried, one of them burned in his backyard. Both charged with the murder, both facing the death penalty. We'll talk about the latest in their trials next.
l e dot com. This is no longer the search for missing children. This is the search for killers. This stretch is just so beyond what anyone could imagine. Breaking news in the case against doomsday prophet Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. Investigators have recovered human remains to Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way, Lori, and I should never come up with this. Lori was his follower. Chad Daybell's the prophet. Chad had a vision, plague, and foreign troops coming to the soil. Well, his wife, Lori Daybell, Bell turn on him. It's just so hard to know where the truth ends. All eyes on this Idaho trial. Big ruling by the judge. The venue changed. The further away you can get from the scene of the alleged incident, the better off you are. Think about all the people that had to die and disappear. It's the doomsday prophet Chad Daybell on trial. And now it's not just the doomsday prophet Chad Daybell, his wife Lori Daybell, formerly Lori Vallow, formerly Lori Ryan, and I think uh, two or three other names. Um, she's now set for trial as well. She was arraigned. Um, let's take a look at what happened inside the courtroom. Having entered those not guilty pleas then, Mr. Archibald, we'd like to discuss the setting of trial in this case. As I'm sure you're aware, there's a companion case that is already scheduled for a trial to start on January 9th. The court's made some previous rulings that apply to this case and were set in that case as well, indicating that these cases would be tried in a joint trial. In order to have your client uh, appear for that trial date, that would require her to go outside of the time frame for speedy trial. Have you discussed with your client her speedy trial rights and whether she intends to waive those to uh, have the trial as now set or, or what's your plan on the trial setting? Yes, Your Honor, we have discussed it. Uh, she does not intend to waive her right to a speedy trial. All right, that's a big issue, right? So you got Lori Daybell charged in the same case with, with, with Chad Daybell. He has a trial date, but she doesn't waive her speedy trial date. So now take a look at the schedule um, that is set right now for the cases against the doomsday couple. Lori, because of the speedy trial, has a date of October 11th this year, 2022. Chad's trial date, January 9th, 2023. Now, there's a new twist now. The East Idaho News is um, reporting tonight that Lori apparently has reviewed with counsel the court's order denying Chad Daybell's request for separate trials. She has instructed her attorneys not to file a request for separate trials. Now I'm even more confused. I need the think tank. Let's bring him back in. Renee Hill, Carmen Rowe, Molly Palmer. Uh, Molly, I'm trying to figure out how this is going to be reconciled here. If she says she doesn't want a separate trial, but she's not waiving speedy trial, that means they've got to try her October 11th. So they're going to have separate trials, right? I mean, speedy trial is the one thing that, uh, the, can the judge override it? Can anyone override it if it's not waived? No, so speedy trial is a right, it's tied to our constitutional rights, and so that's what the judge is focused on. And certainly, if if they had set these as trials to be jointly tried together, she could have asked for severance, she could have asked and argued that there's a reason that they should be tried separately, and the judge could deny that. I mean, severance is often hard to win as a defense attorney wanting a trial separate from your co-defendant, but speedy trial is speedy trial, and unless, her attorneys ask for a motion, you know, and ask to extend the time through a motion. I think they're going to go ahead and try this case within that very short time frame, and we'll see it here on Court TV in October. This is uh, Carmen. So, what are your thoughts, Carmen, about uh, separate versus together? If Lori goes first um, by herself, is, is, is that is that a better situation for her? Is that a worse situation? Well, Vinny, like Molly said, severance is going to benefit both of these defendants. So I think it was why? a tactical Tell us move. why. Tell us why it benefits because these defendants. 
they're going to point the finger at the other. And when you don't have the other sitting right next to you and all of their laundry coming out in the middle of your trial, you have a benefit and they're going to take advantage of it. And so from the very beginning, Chad tried to get away from her and we thought maybe because she was found incompetent, he was going to move forward and actually have a trial without her. Wouldn't that be great? And then alas, she becomes competent. So then we're thinking, okay, they're going to have to go together. And here's this move that her lawyers make where they're going to force the state to trial on a death penalty case real quick. I mean, we don't do trials this fast on death penalty cases in Houston ever. So one, they're putting the state to their evidence in a very short period of time, and they are doing it alone without their co-defendant. I think this is a great tactical advantage. And if it happens in October, you know, this is her best opportunity going into this trial. But then on the other hand, Renee Hill, she says, I, I don't want a separate trial. But so if she says, I don't want a separate trial, but I don't want to waive my speedy trial, then she's going to get a separate trial. Absolutely. And just like Carmen and, and Molly have said, this is a constitutional issue as to whether or not she's going to waive her speedy trial. And she has already indicated that she will not do that. So her attorneys are going to have to explain to her that although you may want to have a trial together with Chad, you're not going to have that trial. You've already refused to waive. The court has set this date down for trial, and that's the date that it should be going. I don't think that it will change at this point since they've already, you know, broached this issue. And like um, Molly said, unless there are some additional motions that are filed to extend the time, I think that they are going to have separate trials. Her attorneys will be very happy about it. And I thought as soon as you indicated that she uh, refused to waive, that that was going up right away. She's pointing the finger at him. And if you look at her demeanor now, her demeanor has changed so much that she has become competent. She's not as bubbly and, and smiling and happy as she was before. And I think that now she's really understanding how serious this is. And I think that that might change her opinion about her last husband. And, and, and I have one other theory about the speedy trial. She wants to get it in before the end of the world, because it's coming. <laughs> oh, it's coming. <laughs> All right. When we come back, time to hear from you, our 13th juror. Amber Heard will be back on the stand Monday. She's going to complete her direct, and then it's time for cross-examination. So I ask you. If you were representing Johnny Depp, what one question would you ask Amber Heard?
five. I just, in my head, instantly think of Kate Moss and the stairs, and I swung at him. And all of my relationship to date with Johnny, I hadn't landed a blow. That moment mentioning Kate Moss, the defense team awfully excited. Did she open the door to some testimony that the defense wants to get in? Maybe some uh, a parade of women who will come in and say, Johnny never hit me, Johnny never abused me, by her indicating that Johnny had abused Kate Moss on a staircase. Interesting moment. Amber Heard will be on cross-examination. I, I asked you today, what one question would you ask Amber Heard on cross? We begin with our 13th year comment of the day. Comes from Sarah. I've got to act it out a little bit. You referenced Mr. Depp pushing Kate Moss downstairs. Did you know that was a fabricated story? And did you use it just to inflame this jury, Ms. Heard? All right, let's bring back in the think tank. Molly, do you have a question for Amber Heard? Oh, my question? Oh. Um, I like Sarah's. I thought that was really good. Mine would get a relevancy objection and a beyond the scope objection. And maybe I wouldn't ask it, but it's the question that America wants to know. And it goes like this. Miss Heard, isn't it true that while you were on the stand testifying in your own case that you consumed illicit narcotics? <laughs> objection. <laughs> I saw that. Yeah, yeah, we all saw that on TikTok. Tom tonight says, Ms. Heard, if Johnny Depp abused you for two to three years before your marriage and it was as bad as you said it was, then why did you marry him? That's from Tom. All right, Carmen, you're up. One question for Amber Heard. I love the question Tom had. I had that thought in my head, but I would ask Miss Heard, it's true that you consider yourself to be a good actress, don't you? Yes. Yes, she does. That As is... do I on the stand. It's been amazing to watch. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Cindy tonight, isn't it true, Ms. Heard, that you were arrested for domestic violence when you assaulted your partner. That might be objectionable, but we shall see. <laughs> Renee, do you have a question for Ms. Heard? Like Cindy's question as well, and my question would be, Ms. Heard, how many times did you rehearse your testimony here today? <laughs> That's a good one. That's really a good one. Sandy tonight. Ms. Heard, where are the police reports and medical reports of injuries sustained by you that you claim Johnny Depp inflicted on you? That's a good one, Molly, huh? I think it's great, and I think it goes to a very important question that we're going to hear, which is this bottle incident that you reference in Australia, how come this never came up in the UK Sun trial and, in fact, never came up at all before you took the stand and said it for the first time last week? Karen tonight, prior to meeting Johnny, did you have a habit of photographing any injuries you obtained? Hmm. What do you think of that one, Carmen? I love it. I love it. Karen's right on the money. I mean, the videos we keep seeing, it's like her secretly recording him under circumstances that are basically compromised. And this this secret recording would make anyone crazy. It would make me crazy. And I think Karen's right on with this one. Samantha tonight, simple one from Samantha. You say, do we have it? There we go, Samantha. You say Johnny sexually assaulted you. Why didn't you report it? Renee, this is a, 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 another good one. Now, they were in Australia at the time. Do you think that, that that would come into play for her as, well, I'm in a foreign country kind of thing? No, I don't think so. Not in the way that she uh, portrayed herself on the stand describing this incident. That's something that if it really happened, you report that. And if nothing else, you go and get yourself checked out.
you go, there should be a medical report of some sort. If there's not a police report, there should at least be a medical examination that was done. And Daphne tonight, Ms. Hurd, why aren't there any photos, video, or audio of any of the severe beatings you claim to have suffered? Is there, is there a response you'd be afraid of with that one, Molly? Is there any, is that a trap or no, is that I a good question? It's a good question because we see her recording everything, everything that we looked at tonight. Here she is with her phone documenting everything, and yet we mysteriously don't have photos and videos of these incredibly intense, severe beatings. Great question. I think all of these viewer questions are, are pretty, pretty good. And there's hundreds more if you go to my Facebook page. Great job, Renee Hill, Carmen Rowe, Molly Palmer, thank you. We'll see you again after the cross-examination. We'll be right back.